Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of the origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. It is my pleasure to introduce Cyrus Taylor, the Albert A. Michelson Professor in Physics at Case Western Reserve University. He joined the faculty in 1988, was chair of the physics department from 2005 until 2006, and then served as dean through 2018 when he returned to the faculty. He was a former Truman Scholar and John Simon Guggenheim Fellow who has worked in both theoretical and experimental high energy physics, and is well known for his leadership in creating innovative programs aimed at empowering scientists and entrepreneurs. And Chris Haufa is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Case Western Reserve University as well, and works on problems in the history and philosophy of science and mathematics. He currently has two books under contract, one with MIT Press, How Knowledge Grows, The Evolutionary Development of Scientific Practice, and with Cambridge University Press, Do the Humanities Create Knowledge? And I'm pleased to welcome, you here, welcome them here tonight to talk about climate change. How do we know what we know? Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here uh, virtually. Um, and uh, uh, so... Uh, Actually, our title is not quite the way uh, Gwen put it. It's climate change, what do we know and how do we know it? And uh, uh, and this is uh, work that I've been doing with Chris Haufa, um, and I'll describe how, the, how some of this came to be along the way. Um, so many of you may have seen me speak before. Uh, you know, Gwen noted that uh, uh, you know, much of my career has been focused on particle physics and I've given two series of origins talks before, uh, one on string theory and the standard model of particle physics, uh, area in which I worked for, for some time, sort of uh, the theoretical approach to it. And then uh, uh, I think most recently, about four years ago, gave a, a talk about um, uh, modern particle detectors and uh, how they actually work. And um, when we go out and discover the Higgs boson, you know, what actually goes into that? All of this background is actually relevant to the kind of thing that we want to talk about today. But um, to, to sort of ease into it, uh, one of the questions I often have gotten uh, over the last year or so is, um, uh, you know, how did I come to decide to, to work on climate change? And the short version is, is throughout my career, every seven or eight years, I sort of ask myself, you know, what should I be doing uh, in sort of the next phase of my career that, uh, that will uh, have the most impact? And uh, the last time I went through this, uh, going off and being dean, uh, kind of delayed things along the way. Um, but um, the last time I did this was about 20 years ago. And I, I took a careful look at uh, issues of climate change at that point. So in, in any case, uh, uh, incorrectly concluded that uh, the world had things under hand and that I should uh, uh, would more profitably uh, spend my time on other things, notably creating the uh, physics entrepreneurship program and then the science and technology entrepreneurship program. Now, um, one of the things that led me to change was a lifelong dream of mine, which was to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And the first time I set out to do this was in 1984. Just after I'd gotten my PhD, I spent a couple of months bumming around East Africa. And so this is a photo of Kilimanjaro uh, from Moshi uh, at the foot of the mountain uh, where many of the expeditions uh, start from to climb the summit. Uh, and in 1984, I, I didn't actually climb the mountain. I came down with malaria instead. And so filed this away as a dream for some future period. Uh, back about four years ago, my daughter had um, spent the summer at Olduvai Gorge uh, uh, at a field school there and had seen the mountain from a plane. And she called me up. This was just before she went off to grad school. Said, Dad, we should climb the mountain this summer. You know, I may not have time to do it again, uh, and, uh, and you may not either. So we headed out. And um, when we got to Moshi and the, the clouds cleared and I could see the mountain, I cried. Uh, so this is uh, the war photo is from about two miles from where the upper one is. Um, uh, same uh, time of year to within a week, uh, and 33 years later, and the vast majority of the, the glaciers on the mountain are gone. Um, you may have seen similar phenomena in the Alps, in the Rockies, um, uh, Iceland, uh, around the world. So um, about a year or so after that, I, I decided it was time to step down as dean and began to start seriously thinking about issues of climate change. <clears throat> 
And about that time, um, our then president uh, tweeted what's actually a very concise summary of the uh, climate denialist position. The whole climate crisis is not only fake news, it's fake science. There is no climate crisis. There's weather and climate all around the world. And in fact, carbon dioxide is the main building block of all. Wow. And this wasn't just the president's tweet. This, this really was official US policy. Uh, and it was sufficiently alarming that um, I guess about six weeks later, the president of the National Academy of Sciences decided to uh, issue a statement in which they reaffirm the consensus uh, view of, of America's uh, premier science uh, establishments. The atmosphere and the Earth's oceans are warming. The magnitude and frequency of certain extreme events are increasing and sea level is rising along our coasts. So uh, as I was reflecting on this, uh, there were a couple of things that occurred to me. The first was, was um, you know, if, if you understand how science is done, um, uh, it's easy to, to, to decide uh, which of these two views that, that uh, are correct, and, and you're able to, to delve down and check it yourself if you've got the time and energy to do so. But if you're a member of the general public, um, it's less clear how it is that you're supposed to, to, um, to weigh these two very different uh, points of view. And it was in that context that I also came to recognize that Case Western Reserve University, one of the uh, premier research universities in the country, while we had many courses uh, related to aspects of climate change at that point, we had no course uh, devoted to uh, the fundamental science of what's happening with uh, uh, human-driven global warming. So I decided to create it. And the, the um, sort of the, the point when I realized that I could do something very special in the course was when I, I went out and looked at um, uh, what had happened since 2000 uh, for uh, sort of the headline number for climate change, that is the global mean temperature anomaly, like how much the uh, global average temperature averaged over night and day, 365 days a year over all longitudes and latitudes has changed from sort of a reference period, 1950 to 1980. And so in 2000, if you look, um, you know, as I said, uh, anyone with a, a good scientific grounding uh, could go in and look at the data and be fairly confident what was going to happen uh, if we didn't change business. But it was another thing to come back 20 years later and look at what really had happened. Now in 2000, you can see that uh, there's a fair amount of noise in, in the background uh, that, that can be understood. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but uh, in the, the ensuing 20 years, the signal to noise ratio has improved, improved um, uh, so remarkably that it sticks out like a sore thumb, which enabled me to structure the course in a way that um, any student at Case Western Reserve University uh, even those uh, in the non-science or engineering majors are able to come in, develop an understanding of the basic uh, theory behind uh, this, global, uh, this measure of global warming, compare it with the data, and then make their own projections as to what's going to happen in various scenarios. And that's sort of the essence of the course. Now, I mentioned that you know, President Trump's tweet said there's, there's weather and there's climate, um, well, climate is essentially weather uh, averaged over a, a long period of time. I thought it'd be helpful to, to actually take a look at what it looks like at every point on Earth for the last, last 100 years. And so we'll, we'll run through that again. So what you're seeing is the anomaly, um, uh, you know, the, the mean temperature month by month across the entire globe for the last 100 years compared to the reference period. And what you can see is there's fluctuations here and there. You know, if you're someone that wants to cast doubt on, on uh, the conclusions of climate science, you can pick a fluctuation, uh, say, in the early 1930s and, and point out, oh, it was warmer than, uh, than it is now or as warm as it is now. But the, the net result of the whole thing, when you average over um, uh, all of this, is you get the graph that we had uh, on the, the slide before. Um, and beyond that, you, you see a couple of features. I mean, there, there's fluctuations all along, but the, the net trend um, is actually kind of scary. And when we get to where we are now, what sticks out like a sore thumb is, first of all, land is warming faster than ocean. 
And this is uh, 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 easy to understand. The, the, the dynamics of oceans are different from land. The heat capacity is different. Uh, they, they can also uh, lose heat by uh, evaporative cooling, which will be part of the story later on. Um, the Arctic is warming much faster than the, the rest of the world. Um, the, the color scale scarcely does justice to it. Uh, you know, the, the scale here is 6.4 degrees centigrade uh, uh, warmer than uh, the average from 1950 to 1980. Uh, so portions of the world are truly scary. And then there's a region off Antarctica that's actually uh, cooled a little bit. And again, skeptics can point to that and say, ah, but averaged over the world as a whole, the story is absolutely clear what's going on. So um, th this is another way of, of looking at what I just talked about, uh, land warming faster than ocean. The headline number that you see in newspapers that um, uh, Paris Climate Accords and so on are phrased in terms of is the global mean temperature anomaly with the goal of, of holding it to one and a half or two degrees uh, Celsius. But what you see has happened is over a period when uh, the world as a whole has warmed by about one degree Celsius, land has uh, warmed by about one and a half, and the ocean's only about 0.7. So that headline number uh, uh, enormously distorts or, or minimizes, in some sense, the impact on where people live. And as I noted, in regions like the Arctic, um, uh, it, it dwarfs what we're looking at here. So. It was uh, sort of at this point that um, uh, Dean Ward uh, for the College of Arts and Sciences last fall had a call for uh, collaborative uh, uh, interdisciplinary summer courses. And uh, Chris, who I'd gotten to know when I was Dean and we'd had a number of interesting conversations, uh, dropped me an email and said, Cyrus, would you be interested in putting together a course on sort of the epistemology of climate science? And I thought about it for a moment, particularly in the context of my background, thinking about the epistemology of particle physics. Uh, and, and took about two milliseconds to say yes. And so what I, I thought I'd do is sort of a lead up towards what Chris is going to do in the second section is, is just talk a little bit about how very different um, uh, uh, experiment, uh, science is done these days than it was in sort of the classical realm. So I think we often think about um, uh, you know, physics or, or science is uh, sort of a lone investigator doing a lone result. And in physics, sort of the paradigmatic example is the um, uh, Galileo's uh, dropping, uh, you know, uh, two bodies off the Leaning Tower of Pisa and observing. We actually recreate the pumpkin drop uh, every Halloween. And um, it's not just that we uh, drop a large pumpkin and a small pumpkin, but we also have uh, sort of a ruler, uh, a, a meter scale along the side of Strosacker and then uh, drop it off to see what happens. And I'll move forward a little bit. Um, so here we go. And it's replicable. You can do it again and get the same answers. So one of the nice things about this setup is everyone in the audience can see that the two pumpkins hit at the same time, but within uh, the accuracy of uh, a human eye. And second, if you're recording it with uh, your camera, you can actually, um, um, by, by using the ruler behind and uh, the measurement of the time, uh, uh, directly uh, calculate what uh, the acceleration due to gravity is. It's a beautiful example of sort of a classical scientific experiment where any person can uh, master every aspect of both theory and experiment. I contrast that to what I talked about uh, four years ago or so with the discovery of the Higgs boson. Okay, Peter Higgs gets a lot of, of uh, uh, notoriety because of, um, uh, uh, you know, he, he's had the key theoretical insight that led to the discovery of it. But he wasn't a lone scientific investigator. The standard model of particle physics, of which his is only a part, has generated many, many more Nobel Prizes on the theory side. And without all of them together, uh, it would amount to nothing. And then the experimental check has required collaborations of thousands of people working for decades, building uh, these uh, detectors seven stories tall with 100 million channels of electronics in order to do it. There is no one that, that actually understands every aspect of this. And so that's the place when 
um, uh, you know, we, we say that we know something about climate science. In general, it's a more complicated story than, uh, than Galileo dropping the ball. And so with that, I think we will hone into um, the first part of this and go to questions. And then Chris will come and, uh, and begin to talk about sort of how this fits in into the context of philosophy of science. Great, thank you, Cyrus, for that that uh, that fascinating introduction to how you got to this and this question and how it relates to um, the difference between modern science and kind of Galileans, science of the time of Galileo. Uh, let's see, I have a question here from David Moore. Um, has the method or technique of measuring the temperatures been consistent over the years? So, so the answer is, is um, uh, the, there's a variety of different things that go into it. Um, you know, the measurements uh, from the 19th century are, are um, uh, older technology thermometers on uh, uh, recorded in ship's logs or in uh, weather stations uh, along uh, uh, around the world. Um, you know, there have been technological developments all along the way, and in uh, the past few decades has been the advent of um, uh, satellite detection and other remote sensing methods of, of, to, to measure temperature. What's important is, um, to, to, and even with a single station where, you know, if you had a thermometer that did not change, if someone chops a tree down next to it, then there's the potential for uh, there being systematic changes, uh, even if, if uh, nominally you're keeping everything fixed. So the task of compiling uh, what those uh, uh, temperature measurements are and reducing it to that single global anomaly requires a formidable amount of work at the level of um, uh, the time series of each individual station, looking at the statistical properties, comparing it to stations around them, and then as technology changes, making sure that, uh, that uh, the calibration that you had for the earlier one matches the calibration that you have for the later one and carrying it through uh, generation by generation. Now, this is often attacked by climate skeptics, but in fact, it's, it's a relatively straightforward, uh, if potentially rather complicated statistical problem. But it's, it's one where, uh, you know, in, in Physics 260, one of the homework assignments actually was working through um, uh, sort of the key characteristics of this so that the students actually understood in detail what goes into those numbers. But the question actually illustrates exactly what I was saying. The, you can understand sort of uh, the, the theory um, behind that single measurement of global temperature anomaly, but the measurements of it are, are uh, sort of compilation of, of you know, hundreds of thousands of, of separate measurements over, over more than a century. Um, I'll probably uh, leave it there. There's a lot more to say. Right. And, and, I, and I'm guessing you, you folks will say some of it in, over the next couple of parts, but. Well, there, 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 there's a limit to how much we can say in detail in terms of this. Uh, we right. can allude to it and invite people to, to uh, you, you know, um, study in greater detail, but um, the amount of work that goes into it is large. But it can be done in a I'm gonna get, course. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do uh, one more. We have one more question that I, that I think we have time for um, from David Hunt. Uh, the 150 year history that you showed seems a small fragment of the Earth's uh, history. Yeah. Wasn't the Earth warmer in the more distant past? Yeah, so, so um, th that's actually a great question. Um, so uh, uh, one of the key things when physicists think about problems um, is uh, sort of what's the scale? Uh, what the, what's the, the spatial scale and what's the temporal scale? And uh, as we'll see um, later on in this talk, the, the thing that sets the, the scale of interest for uh, what we're doing at the moment is uh, sort of the, the scale, the, the time scale with which we're um, providing major perturbations to the uh, atmospheric interactions with uh, solar and infrared radiation. We, we certainly have temperature records going back much further than that. But for example, um, when we get later and talk about um, pumping CO2 into the atmosphere and what we're doing, we can look at that earlier on as well, but CO2 there is responding to rather than uh, typically driving uh, what's going on just because there wasn't an analog of people there. So the, the, the whole history of uh, the climate of the earth, and for that matter, the, the history of climate on, on you know, earth-like planets or semi-earth-like planets like Mars and Venus are really, really interesting and relevant just to make sure that the, the, the models that you develop for, for uh, addressing Earth actually work uh, on other areas where we have data or can infer it. Uh, 
Um, but it's not really relevant to what we're talking about um, on, on sort of the human time scale and, and the next, say, 80 years or so. Great. Okay. Thank you, Cyrus. And uh, I guess we will turn now to Chris. Chris Haufa, and why don't you share your screen? Hi. So, yeah, thank you, uh, Glenn. And uh, thanks a lot, Cyrus, for, um, for setting me up. Um, so I am a philosopher of science. Um, much of what I do as a philosopher of science involves trying to understand the nature of scientific knowledge, what's distinctive about it. Um, and that takes me to a few different areas. Um, I study the practice of science, right? How and why scientists approach questions about nature in the way that they do. Um, I also look at the history of science, um, particularly looking at large scale patterns and kind of the development of scientific knowledge over time. Um, and using that data, I and my fellow philosophers of science um, try to come up with you know, theories, philosophical theories, models of how, uh, what makes science special? Why is it so distinctive? Um, why is it so different from other um, forms of human activity? Uh, and then we use those theories to analyze current scientific debates, right? So asking, um, for example, does some scientific theory or line of investigation and I have the qualities we come to expect from exemplary scientific research, right? And those expectations we've derived from studying the practice of science um, and the history of science and kind of trying to explain what it is that makes science so successful, right? Um, the, uh, the particular corner of philosophy of science I'm going to talk about today is um, the contemporary philosophical theory about what makes scientific knowledge unique, um, what we could call the social model uh, of scientific knowledge. Um, and to do that, I'm going to begin by contrasting it with um, what you could call the classical uh, framework for understanding scientific knowledge, um, which was focused predominantly on individual agents and how they formed beliefs about nature. Uh, and this framework dates back to uh, the early 17th century through people like Francis Bacon and Galileo, Descartes, um, whom uh, many of you I'm sure have heard of. Um, and it's part of the scientific revolution. It, it's kind of uh, one of the main drivers of the scientific revolution. And um, it develops out of the uh, what was then a newly achieved realization that it's important to observe how nature actually works rather than simply speculating on how it must work. Um, it's, you know, I think when I first discovered this, uh, highly unintuitive um, and just, I mean, almost unfathomable that, you know, prior to the scientific revolution, a lot of um, theorizing about nature really had nothing to do with observation. And um, to a large degree, uh, theorists were hostile towards observation. They thought it tended to distract you from understanding nature um, rather than uh, promote the understanding of nature. And, and so one of the kind of major turning points um, uh, that the scientific revolution involves is this, uh, the kind of rise in prominence of, of the observation as a central component of our uh, of scientific knowledge. Um, so I'm gonna I'll talk a little bit about uh, the contrast between that framework and and what we now uh, the kind of perspective from which we now view scientific knowledge, um, and then I'll t move into a specific components of the social model of scientific knowledge, particularly um, the. Uh, necessary dependence uh, 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 on testimony uh, rather than direct observation, um, the necessity of this institution of expertise, right, which um, is uh, present but um, almost uh, unrecognizable um, when compared with kind of the modern proliferation of, uh, uh, of expertise. 
Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about the process of consensus, scientific consensus, right? The process by which um, uh, the agreement uh, among members of the scientific community uh, tends to increase over time. Okay, so um, let's look at a few contrasts between the classical understanding of scientific knowledge um, and the modern social framework. Um, the, the philosophical principles about scientific knowledge that were based uh, on the idea that knowledge of nature can be obtained by a single individual are really not a very good fit for understanding how scientific knowledge is acquired. So this is um, the, the point at which uh, Cyrus left off, right, with the, um, the pumpkin drop uh, experiment, right? That's something that a single individual can sort of, uh, you know, discover every aspect of um, all by themselves, right? Um, and the social framework, right, recognizes that modern scientific investigation uh, is done by hundreds of collaborators. And in fact, even when it is, uh, even for experiments that are done and kind of graspable by single individuals, um, it really takes a scientific community um, for those results to rise to the level of scientific knowledge, right? Just because somebody finds something out in an experiment that they've done, um, it's a long road from there to uh, um, the status of scientific knowledge, right? And so if you have a model of scientific knowledge that's kind of built on the idea that um, all knowledge of nature can be acquired by uh, individuals, um, you, you, the modern approach to uh, scientific research is going to be really unrecognizable. Um, and it's just not going to... Um, tell you what you want to know about how scientific knowledge uh, is acquired. Uh, another contrast, um, which um, uh, Cyrus alluded to, is the fact that in the classical framework, an individual uh, can typically have a firm grasp over every aspect of a scientific investigation, um, right? So a single individual can come up with the theory, the scientific theory. Uh, she can design the experiments, she can manufacture the experimental apparatus, uh, and she can analyze the results, right? All of this can be done in a single shop by um, a single individual. Um, you know, what we uh, would have thought of as the man of science uh, in former times, right? Um, the contrast with uh, uh, modern scientific investigation, many forms of modern scientific investigation anyway, uh, is that individual collaborator, collaborators may only have uh, a firm grasp of their part of the investigation, right? Um, their expertise doesn't extend uh, beyond that. Um, they're more, most likely acquainted with a lot of um, different branches of scientific knowledge that go into uh, the collaborations. Um, but with respect to uh, really, you know, having kind of cutting edge um, you know, artisanal knowledge of, of um, a specific aspect of science, uh, the, the scope of their knowledge is, is fairly limited. Um, that's, uh, you know, an artifact of the need for specialization as our understanding of nature becomes more complex. Um, I think particularly uh, interesting from a philosophical perspective is the fact that uh, no individual has a firm grasp over every aspect of the investigation, right? Collaborators depend on each other for generating a single scientific result, a result that gets reported right, to, um, to the scientific community. They have to trust that um, each member of the collaboration knows what they're talking about with respect to their aspect of the collaboration. Um, there's no other way uh, to generate uh, our knowledge of these really, really, really complex problems. Um, uh, a third um, interesting contrast involves the fact that uh, the classical model is kind of based on the idea that inferences um, can be made on the basis of a direct observation of nature, right? So you, you know, you have a, 
experimental setup in your lab and you run that uh, experiment and uh, you record what you observe. Um, the, uh, the, the social framework recognizes that in many cases, um, inferences about nature now are made on the basis of statistics and simulations, right? Stuff that um, is kind of an abstraction uh, from, from the direct uh, access to nature that uh, kind of form the foundation of the classical framework for, for scientific knowledge. Um, and in order for these inferences, in order to, to kind of justify these inferences from statistics or simulation, you need, you know, they're much more open to interpretation uh, often than the kind of direct observations, say with the, um, the uh, dropping of the pumpkins, right? And it requires some system of conventions that um, allows the scientific community to come to agreement on what the data suggest about nature, right? Um, the first aspect of the, the social model um, that I wanna talk about is this idea of testimony. Um, for philosophers, the fact that scientists depend on each other's knowledge uh, means that a good philosophical theory about scientific knowledge is going to require us to think carefully about how we acquire knowledge from other people. Um, the, the, the story of Galileo is a good illustration of this. Right? Um, in fact, almost all the knowledge that we have is acquired through testimony rather than direct observation, right? So think, you know, pick some bit of knowledge at random um, that you uh, that you have. Uh, chances are you you got that from hearing about it, reading about it, um, having it told to you, uh, rather than direct observation, um, right? And uh, although. As, as Cyrus pointed out, anybody can see um, the, the, uh, the pumpkins drop and kind of measure um, how that process works. Um, but not everybody can see uh, whether or not Galileo actually performed that experiment, right? I mean, that's emblematic of historical knowledge in general, which makes up a large part of our knowledge. Um, most of our knowledge of history comes through testimony and our knowledge, in fact, of Galileo dropping comes inescapably from testimony, in particular, Galileo's biographer. Uh, and in fact, um, experts, historians aren't even sure that he actually performed those experiments. Um, that's just part of the, uh, one of the hazards that uh, you run into um, once you realize how much of our knowledge is dependent on, on testimony. Um, almost everything scientists believe about nature comes from other scientists, right? Either through publications, right? Research articles that, um, that other scientists publish, uh, grant proposals that they may have read, um, meeting presentations, right? You go to a conference and you hear about some research um, that's going on, or even informal chats, right? Uh, emails with other people, maybe chatting at a conference. Um, that all goes into how, you know, uh, practitioners in the natural sciences shape their own investigations. Um, you know, all but a, a, you know, only a sm small bit of their uh, knowledge of nature comes from actually observing nature. Um, it doesn't come from doing experiments, right? It comes from testimony. So the interesting problem for philosophers is trying to understand then how scientists determine uh, whose testimony to accept. And this is where the notion of expertise comes in. Um, expertise facilitates the acceptance of testimony. And unsurprisingly, the kind of concept of expertise uh, arises concomitantly um, with the, um, the new role of uh, direct observation of nature um, in the, the natural sciences in the, in the 17th century. Um, scientific communities will generally develop their own norms, their own conventions for evaluating expertise, right? Typically that um, involves looking at somebody's, you know, a track record of, of exemplary uh, published research um, and, you know, scientific reputation, the opinions of other scientists. Um, 
it's just no longer possible for an individual to base all their beliefs on nature, about nature, on what she's directly observed. Uh, most of it must rest on the reports of others, um, which in most cases are not based on direct observation. And right? even when you consult somebody else, typically they're reporting a you know a digest of of others, uh, the research of others. Um, Right. If you want to know something uh, in modern science, you need to ask an expert or or two or three uh, or, you know, an entire community uh, if you have access to one. The last thing I want to um, talk about is uh, the, the kind of third important component of the social model is the process of scientific consensus, um, which I think is really nicely illustrated by um, these graphs that I think you should be able to see pretty well. Um, which I borrowed from the highly collaborative discipline of particle physics. Now, what these graphs show is the kind of the range of estimates of values of certain properties of, of certain subatomic particles reported by different collaborations in a given year, right? So in this uh, top left one, right, you have the uh, lifetime of a neutron, um, you know, uh, measured in, I guess, seconds, um, uh, you know, at, starting in the 60s and, and going all the way up to today. Um, and what you'll notice uh, is that each of these graphs has a characteristic shape, right? Um, the most distinctive, and this is just a small sample of the graphs that could be generated um, that have this distinctive shape, right? The, and the most distinctive feature of this shape is, is what happens to the size of the range of estimates over time, right? It gets smaller and smaller, in some cases kind of asymptoting to uh, a single value. Um, and that's emblematic of the process of scientific consensus. Um, it's a process by which range of expert opinion narrows over time. Right? In the, from the social models perspective, we can say we know something uh, when the scientific community achieves consensus. It's this increasingly narrow range of opinion that lies at the foundation um, of our knowledge of climate change. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Chris, for, for that nice introduction to the epistemology of science. Um, and uh, we have a, a bunch of, of, of questions here, uh, some in the chat, some in the q and I'm going to start with uh, Ralph Bertonaska. Let's, let's see. I think this is a, uh, uh, there's a question here at the end. Regarding the social aspect of science, it's notable that with respect to at least special and general relativity, Einstein was clearly in the classical mode, individualistic and starting from first principles. Mm -hmm. Clearly in today's world, a major exception, but what of it? Um, okay, good. Right. So, I mean, the, I mean, there's a number of things you could say, right? One uh, is that, um, this is a bit of theorizing, um, right? Which is much easier to do as an individual than kind of the um, experimental collaborations, um, measurements that uh, go into particle physics or, or modern science. So, um, you know, and I think to, to some degree, um, the, the modern scientific theorizing retains that, uh, that individualist spirit, but, um, Increasingly, as Cyrus, I'm sure, can tell you, uh, you know, the I mean, the the muon G2 uh, experiment that just came out, I think, illustrates this nicely. That actually, um, even the process of theorizing is a community level endeavor, right? Understanding what the theory itself is is a, is a community level endeavor. Um, and I mean, oh, sorry, go ahead, Cyrus. Yeah, I, I was just going to jump in in the context of Einstein. Uh, you, you know, he wrote down his theory. But um, uh, it wasn't, uh, uh, and, and certainly got a great degree of notoriety for it, but it didn't actually become scientific knowledge until um, there were measurements made that uh, confirmed the predictions, starting with uh, the, the expeditions in 1919 for the solar eclipse, which was a huge scientific uh, 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 investment just after the end of World War I, all the way up to, to LIGO, right, which is uh, an experiment with, you know, which the planning for it began 40 years ago, and uh, you know it's consumed, uh, you know, uh, well over a billion dollars uh, just on the hardware budget, and the collaboration is is more than a thousand people. 
-hmm. And we continue to, to make observations to try to test whether general relativity is in fact the correct, uh, yeah. correct theory of gravity, right? It's consistent on cosmological scales. It's consistent yeah. in strong, when, it's, when gravity is strong, all sorts of things. Let's go back with where we left off. Single global mean temperature over a time scale of, of uh, order of a century. Right, this is um, the, it's a time scale well suited towards the human impact on uh, uh, the atmosphere and uh, the, the climate system. It's short compared to the time in which um, uh, ocean currents uh, uh, complete their, um, uh, could, could rearrange themselves on a large scale. And it's short compared to um, uh, other drivers of the climate system. So this is data and, and it, it's only data. Um, uh, but to really make sense and understand uh, where, where the human element comes in, it's, it's helpful to, to bring in the modeling side, the theoretical uh, side. And we've been talking about sort of the dichotomy of the two in terms of building scientific knowledge along the way. Uh, John Rule gave a great talk on the physics of uh, climate change, I think about three years ago. Uh, I, I can't hope to, to uh, you know, redo the whole thing in uh, the, the time I have here, but there are a couple of key things that I, I want to highlight that I think are important in terms of what we're doing. First is, um, you know, as I said before, physicists like to start off with um, a sort of global variables, averaging over as much as possible to re reduce the complexity of the system. And that's what we were looking at with the, the temperature anomaly. So when you do this, right, we're, at, we're averaging over um, the Earth's surface, we're averaging over ocean currents, we're averaging over, um, uh, you know, uh, the atmospheric circulation system things that people questioned him about at the time. The point is, is the average over all of those um, basically means that, uh, that um, at this level that you're looking at, they don't matter. What does matter is the overall energy balance of the Earth. Um, the, the total amount of energy coming in from the sun has to equal the total amount of energy that the Earth is radiating. And uh, just very simply, uh, averaged over uh, all latitudes and longitudes and uh, all times of day and all days of the year, we, we get about 340 watts per square meter. Of that, about 30% is uh, reflected by clouds on the surface. One of the things that's important is because the sun is hot, um, it radiates relatively sh uh, shorter ra radiation than the Earth as a whole does. And fortuitously, um, this, this is in a region where the atmosphere is reasonably transparent. Of that 341 watts per square meter, 161 roughly is actually absorbed uh, by the Earth's surface and provides energy input. Now, because the Earth also has a temperature, it also radiates and it radiates in the infrared and the atmosphere is relatively opaque to, to the infrared radiation. On average over the, the um, Earth's surface as a whole, et cetera, et cetera, um, less than 10% of the 400 uh, watts per square meter radiated upwards from the Earth's surface actually make it out to space. The rest is absorbed by um, are the atmosphere or clouds in the atmosphere. Um, some of it's actually carried up by convection. Some of it's carried up in the form of weight and heat of moisture, which uh, as uh, the uh, parcel of air rises in the atmosphere, it cools, and so it'll condense releasing heat. But the bulk of it is, is a radiative here. And one of the important things is that, um, as you know from flying in a plane or, or climbing a mountain, right? Um, the atmosphere gets colder as you go up just from simple thermodynamic considerations. Uh, on average, about uh, six and a half degrees uh, centigrade per kilometer. So the, the upwelling radiation uh, is absorbed or in the atmosphere, it gets re-emitted and absorbed and re-emitted. The part that actually uh, makes it, you know, if you're looking from outside down, you're basically seeing into to sort of the limit of uh, opacity. It's like looking into a, a fog bank. And the radiation that's uh, making its way out to space is coming, relatively speaking, from uh, higher up in the atmosphere, so cooler. And so um, what that, uh, whereas the radiation emitted back down is from the lower part, and so is warmer. So there's actually an asymmetry here. And this is what's behind uh, essentially the greenhouse effect, the, the, um, resulting in sort of the net result being that Earth has to be warmer than it would be if there were no atmosphere. Now, um, David Hunt asked about longer time scales. Um, so it's certainly the case that, um, uh, you know, as we go back uh, hundreds of thousands of years, uh, we, we had, for example, uh, uh, glacial cycles and so on. 
So what's driving that is, is not directly properties of the atmosphere, but in fact, um, uh, as uh, uh, the Earth's orbit um, is subject to all sorts of, of uh, well understood and calculable um, perturbations, it becomes more eccentric, um, um, precession and so on. And so there's actually a change in, in sort of the average solar radiation per, uh, received, for example, in, in uh, uh, North America that is the driving force behind uh, the, the glacial cycles. The time scale of that is tens of thousands of years. It's irrelevant for uh, considerations of what we're doing to the climate uh, at our present time. Other things that can, can affect it that, that aren't due to humans are things like volcanic eruptions, where um, you can inject large amounts of aerosols into the atmosphere that can actually change for a short period of time the amount of radiation that's reflected. And this is behind some of the ideas for geoengineering and so on. But putting aside um, things like that, which are well understood or reasonably well understood, on the time scale that we're interested in, my lifetime, your lifetime, and the lifetime of our kids and grandkids, those things are irrelevant. So, so what's behind that absorption in the atmosphere? There's a bunch of pieces. So this is a plot looking down from outer space of what the intensity is as a function of wavelength. And what you see, is that um, there's well-defined bands, say around 15 microns, due to vibrations in rotational spectra of uh, carbon dioxide, which strongly absorb. And I mentioned that um, uh, you know, the radiation that gets out to space comes from higher up in the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide uh, absorbs quite strongly. And so the, the radiation going out to space there is coming from quite high up in the atmosphere. And plotted on here are, are sort of the temperatures for black body temperatures. Um, and, and you see that on average in the carbon dioxide band, it's probably about 225 degrees Kelvin that's uh, radiating. You put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it's gonna push that final surface of, of radiation up higher, which makes it colder, which means that the, the bottom of that peak will drop, there'll be less radiation going out, but the overall balance has to, uh, overall radiation has to balance, which means the earth has to warm to be able to push the, that radiation out in the other bands. And as that happens, uh, water vapor comes into play as sort of a supporting actor. As uh, if you raise the temperature of the earth a little bit where there's bodies of water, it's going to increase the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. Water vapor is also a powerful greenhouse gas and that amplifies the effect that you get from uh, pumping the CO2 into the atmosphere. There, there's other players as well. Um, the, um, this is sort of a, a short illustration, again, looking down from outer space. These are from simulations. Black is uh, essentially on, on the left-hand side is what I showed before. The blue is what that curve would look like if you turned off CO2. All of a sudden, um, that, that uh, CO2 absorption would go away. Uh, you'd just have the, uh, the emission due to the other properties. Um, and it would drive the temperature of the Earth down if we got rid of all CO2 in the atmosphere. Conversely, the red is what would happen if uh, 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 Earth was a, a dead planet like Mars with no water vapor, even if it had carbon dioxide. Um, namely, that uh, the absorption that takes place um, in, in the area be between the red and the uh, black bands would go away. Uh, and again, the impact on the atmosphere and on, on our temperature would be profound. So, what I described is a fairly simple model that you know, we worked through in 260 uh, in, in a fair amount of detail. But there's questions, what about variations from it? And uh, you know, again, in John's, there, there are a lot of questions, well, what about atmospheric circulation? What about um, uh, this and that? So one of the things you can do is take the simple model and ask, what do deviations from it look like? You can take a database of, of uh, 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 surface temperatures of the Earth, and for the last 20 years, you've got satellite data directly measuring the outgoing long wavelength radiation uh, from the Earth. And you can look at um, uh, how they, they compare to what it would be if everything was the average. And so this is a, a four-year cycle, and the, the deviations um, are, are pretty clear. Um, and what you realize pretty quickly is that um, you, you're seeing essentially in the, the uh, equatorial and temporal bands, the, the Hadley cell circulation. The blue are areas that um, uh, are uh, uh, basically have more water vapor than uh, on the average. You see it's concentrated over the, the rainforest in the tropics and so on. Uh, 
And uh, the brown areas are where it's drier than uh, the average. And you, you see that this encompasses the major desert patterns. Um, but none of this is set up to directly look at water vapor. It's just looking at outgoing long wavelength radiation and temperature. Averaged over the, the whole Earth and averaged over the year, none of these things, all of these things go away so that they don't enter directly into that uh, part of the single global temperature. But what it does show you is that the deviations are sensitive to the aspects of, of weather patterns that matter. And if these change as we pump more CO2 into the atmosphere, this requires much more work than you can do in my course. It requires the major simulations uh, in order to begin to address it. But as you see the, um, the blue on an annual cycle turning into monsoons in Southeast Asia and India, or um, in uh, Western North America, you see the advent of fire season. If we modify these circulation patterns as a result of what we're doing, uh, then the impact on at least people in some parts of the world could be really, really profound. So this is a level of detail that goes beyond the, the kinds of conclusions you can draw at the, less, uh, at the present time are less sound or than, than uh, for the global mean because they're just a lot more science that's involved, a lot less data that we have to work with. Um, but the, uh, and, and this is the reason why the IPCC has set up sort of a process where, uh, you know, on something like a seven year cycle, we work to continually refine as a community what the projections are and what our understanding is of, of what we're doing to the world. Now I said, what was driving all of this was um, uh, atmospheric CO2. And uh, we, we have data back hundreds of thousands of years from ice core data, but it's smeared as a result of the process of forming bubbles uh, in the ice. We've got good high quality data since the 1950s uh, from Mauna Loa and, and from other observatories more recently. And in that time, in my lifetime, uh, CO2 has gone from about 315 parts per million uh, to about 420. For reference, the average over say the 1500 years before that was uh, somewhere around 280 parts per million. Now, what's driving that? That's driven essentially by the fossil fuels that, uh, the, or largely by the fossil fuels that we've been burning as a global civilization since the advent of the Industrial Revolution. And this is a really scary chart. I was born in 1958. We're here at 2020. And so let me ask a question, take 10 seconds or 15 seconds. What fraction of fossil carbon emissions uh, since the start of the Industrial Revolution have taken place in your lifetime. So I, I should say, while, while you're thinking about that, my students, all of whom thought they were sophisticated um, in terms of their understanding of uh, the issues of, of climate change coming into the class, were stunned by the answer for them. For me, I was born in 1958, 83% of the carbon emissions into the atmosphere since the start of the Industrial Revolution have happened in my lifetime. My students born in 2001, a year or two after the last time I'd looked at it, 39% of all the emissions have taken place in their lifetime. The rate at which we are pounding on the atmosphere is extraordinary. The, the, the time scale in which we're making these kinds of changes is, is, um, should be terrifying to all of us. So we understand how we got here. Where are we headed? Well, my, my students, particularly those from the, uh, the natural sciences and engineering, were really discomfited that, okay, they understand everything uh, up until now, but the science doesn't tell us what's going to happen next because we are part of the system. Uh, it necessarily involves politics, right? So the goal of, of the intergovernmental panel on climate change process is to provide the best scientific information to policymakers and, uh, and political leaders so that they can make informed decisions in the context of all the other things that they have to do, raising people out of poverty, you know, maintaining jobs. So part of what's happened in, in the IPCC uh, community is to imagine various scenarios going forward and, uh, and in an iterative process and couple them to projections for in a, a given scenario what are the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere going to look like? The top one uh, in sort of blue is one where, uh, which assumes that the world as a whole decides to double down on fossil fuels and go, uh, go for economic growth at all costs, counting on, on future uh, presently unforeseen technological developments to solve the, uh, the, uh, the problems caused by um, uh, hitting the climate that hard. 
The goal just under that is sort of an extrapolation of, of what we've been doing for the, the last 30 or 40 years, very close to what the Trump administration assumed. Uh, the Trump administration in assessing automobile standards assumed that in 2100, uh, the CO2 concentration would be 789 parts per million. And then in various scenarios in which we're more aggressive about trying to, to uh, address the role of greenhouse gases, you, you have some of the other scenarios. Now, if you look in a textbook or something like that, uh, they'll typically then show you the result of large uh, uh, simulations, uh, the, the large models, to tell you what the temperature is. But if all you're interested in is the, just the global, um, uh, the, the global mean temperature, it's actually now possible for students to do it in class. And so this was the solution from uh, homework four. Um, and uh, basically saying that uh, on the scenario that we're on at the moment, uh, you know, if we don't change what we're doing, then the, the world as a whole will see about three and a half degrees centigrade of, of uh, warming uh, by 2100. Land, of course, will be higher than that, and the Arctic is, is terrifying to even think about. So um, this brings us essentially to the end. Um, what's done is done, but the future is in our hands. Thank you very much. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins, with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.